Hello, my name is Ken Torian. I'm a researcher at KTH in Stockholm University mostly, and uh, I'll be presenting a paper about backcasting and backcasting used as the strategic management tool uh, for meeting VUCA challenges. That's the title. It was published in the Journal of Strategy and Management in 2019. So the overall idea with this paper is to make a little bit of a validation and assessment of backcasting and see if it really holds up to be useful for strategic management, fairly broadly speaking. And we did that by uh, assembling a number of criteria and uh, the main bunk of them were based on the idea of VUCA. So I did not write this paper alone. I wrote it together with my colleague, uh, Martin Wendel. And uh, we were working at KTH at the time, both of us, and uh, did teaching together. Both of us had experience from backcast. We had come to this method that originated in uh, sustainability practice or sustainability studies mostly uh, by two different roads. We thought, hey, this is strange. VUCA and backcasting seems to overlap a little bit. So that was the idea to, to form a research question uh, to assess backcasting as a method with the help of VUCA. Mm -hmm. So backcasting is similar to scenario planning or scenario making in that you have a future that you you project you make a projection you try to imagine a plausible future of some sort but then it's sort of going backwards it's, it's uh, based on the idea that we pretend that we are in the future already and then we ask the question what happened for us to get here so that turns a number of things upside down, so to speak, you will be backwards reasoning. And, and the idea is that that aids creativity and mitigates some cognitive bias. So VUCA then, well, we had discussed VUCA a number of times and uh, it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, that got adopted by the strategy community as a, metaphor or a good way to describe what we face today or what we see today in strategic management with these faster changing environments, new technologies coming in, things changing faster and faster. There was also attempts to propose what to do when you are in the VUCA situation. And uh, we thought that it was not really reaching all the way to a useful method. And uh, one approach was VUCA Prime, originating from the work of uh, Bob Johansson, where another VUCA acronym was Vision, Understanding, Clarity, and Agility. But digging down in these four different challenges, volatility, it's about the rate of change. And we thought maybe that, you know, <laughs> that's something you deal with with more uh, agility and uh, ambiguity. Well, that maps to understanding. So we thought that it's not really all the way there. And there were also some other attempts to prescribe means for dealing with VUCA. For example, Bennett and Lumaine had a short piece in Harvard Business Review on some approaches that firms could use. So we thought, hang on, let's go deeper here and assess this a little bit more in detail. So first of all, these four factors, complexity and volatility, that's, you know, the, that's attributes of a situation. While uncertainty and ambiguity is more descriptive of the information that exists around the situation. Um, ambiguity can be defined as a lack of understanding. It means that cause effect relationships are unclear. The situation has equivocality. So it's a bit confusing. While uncertainty on the other hand, that's more uh, in, in organizational science and management, we 
often talk about lack of information. So these two are related. Complexity, on the other hand, that's how many variables are there in here? How many interactions are there between these variables? And so on. So it's a description of the actual situation or decision that we are looking at. And volatility, that could be thought of as the rate of change within this information set or in this situation. So that has implications because it means that these are not independent. It means that complexity and volatility drives uncertainty in terms of ignorance about the value of a variable in the set. We don't know exactly where we are at this. We don't know, for example, how big the market is. Well, ambiguity, on the other hand, is ignorance about whether the variable exists in the set at all. Uncertainty can be resolved by asking questions. We know that there's lack of information. We can go out and find that information. And if we put that piece into our decision, we can derive an answer. So we can ask questions, basically. And uh, ambiguity needs to be resolved first because we are confused. So we don't know exactly what uh, questions we need to ask. And that relies on rich information. That means that you need to discuss and you need to try different viewpoints. You need to have uh, many cues of information. That means that there's tone of voice, there is a body language and uh, uh, as much of uh, different channels engaged at the same time as possible. So we co-define the problem together and try to reach a, a common view or a shared view of what the situation is about. Then we don't know everything, but we transformed a messy, confusing situation to something that we have an overview or a map of, and we can use questions to get to that uh, residual uncertainty that still exists. So for example, we might come up with an understanding of a situation that we need to grow our business beyond our uh, current geographical market. And then, of course, we can use much more lean information, much more specific information that we can send in text or numbers to find out information such as how large is the market in country X or Y or Z. So there is a specific order, there is a specific difference between the information that works, and this is where we tried to see, hang on, backcasting is a method that embeds, first of all, this dialogue, this sense-making together and, and conducting to reach information, and it also generates a structured output where you can um, define actions or other points you need to investigate further. So maybe backcasting could be something here. Maybe backcasting can help us with VUCA. Hmm. So before going into the result, I thought it could be good to describe backcasting a little bit more in detail uh, for those not familiar with how it works. So it would start maybe by defining the strategic problem. What's the st strategic challenge? The, the main thing that keeps us awake at night in our company or, or, or organization. And something that is a long-term issue that we can't just find an optimal answer to. It's useful to define that because when you have backcasting applied, you often do it in a workshop format. You have some facilitators, you have one or several group of participants. Often you want to have many participants because then you spread the ambiguity reduction and the collective sharing of ideas and, and new understanding and also the motivation and commitment to, to the strategy or the activities that it comes up as a result. And uh, 
you can think about also what the outcome you need are. Do you want do we want mostly a process outcome that we align our thinking and uh, instead of having uh, each of us an individual view of the future that is different from everybody else's, we go out with a shared view of the future, although we want more content coming out like concrete plans and and uh, strategies. So that would be a good first step. Next step then is to find a vision, I call it. So this is where there's a similarity with scenario methods. We make a projection about the future, but in the scenario, you can say that we have a future state of a socio-technical system or socio-economic system. And in backcasting is often that we want to have a projection of us in the future, not only the future per se, but uh, maybe a vision is a better word than a scenario. We can also use multiple scenarios in other forms. But for uh, this simplified process, we, we let's say we use one scenario and we have a position in that scenario. It might be that we are the industry leaders um, uh, in 2030. And you describe that in some sort of a nice and uh, compelling and inspirational way. That would be a starting point. And uh, next step could be that you go deeper into the vision and define it more. Could be that you also look at the current state, but at some point, sooner or later, the main activity next is to do what we call the analysis. And that is saying that, all right, it's 2030 and we are the industry leaders. What happened? And it turns out when you do this with people that they get, uh, they get a lot of energy uh, by pretending that something has happened that is dramatically different from today. And it releases a lot of creativity and discussion. Your task as a group now is to come up with the explanation. And, and to the extent uh, that you have difficulties in getting people on board, you can uh, quite easily ask them, asking them to, to follow the projection and play, play the rules of this exercise. It's an exercise for, for generating a new viewpoint. So, yeah, so this is often a lot of fun and uh, you can work with several groups and generate, for example, lists or post-its about events that happened, actions that were taken, trends that changed in different ways, etc., and uh, come up with a good list. And you can prioritize those lists or those, uh, if you get a lot, what I call links between the future and the past, and you can prioritize these by voting with dots or, or whatnot. But anyway, you, you should come up with a set of different links that you can work on and process for the next step. Now, here is where the interesting psychological effects comes in also, because when we think forward oriented, we think about what will happen in the next year or what how will we how how will we succeed in this transition etc the brain is is designed that way it works that way that it focuses a lot on challenges and problems while if you think backwards the brain acts much more neutral toward linking cause effect means and end uh, in backwards reasoning compared to forward reasoning which is much much more uh, sensitive to problems and risks and so like over emphasizing those and uh, for example uh, one thing that came up when I did this is that uh, we realized that we couldn't do this alone so we started to work with Google that's maybe not something you could come up with starting with current states looking forward because the the reasoning tends to be constraint based while if you look from the future backwards it's much more possibility based. Right. So next, we need to do something with all these different links and uh, there's uh, different methods you can use. 
but uh, basically the, there is a prioritization step usually and then you qualify the different links in terms of what do we need to take action on, what do we need to monitor, what can we ignore, and then if we take these actions, uh, in what sequence should we take them and so on. So then you already have a little bit of a kernel, a little bit of a rough, rough draft for something that could be developed into a strategy for long term. And you can also see at what points are there major options branching out, you know, so we have a base path to get to the future, but maybe there are alternative paths at some points. You can see if there's a signpost like trend developments and so on that you can predict that can inform you when you need to change path beforehand. And, and given that you already discussed with all the involved people and reached these conclusions together, and you have a mental and organizational preparedness to change path quickly compared to if you or somebody realizes that things are not going the way we, we thought and uh, we need to change. And then you need to persuade everybody to see that. And some people might say, for example, that is just a temporary glitch. The inflation in, in the world coming now is, is temporary and will pass, for example. It's something we see now. It's not for sure that it will. And if you consider it beforehand, it's much more uh, likely that people can recognize it and directly come on board on the, the phase shift and the, the plan adjustments that needs to be taken. So that is a very powerful effect of backcasting that I have a lot of hope for making companies more agile. Yeah, so you have a list of activities that you could take, uh, put them in order, and then you can transform this into some sort of a rough roadmap. And it's useful to end the workshop or workshop series with uh, upfront commitment. You know, who is going to do what and when, and especially important to do this if, if you have the people controlling resources engaged in the back costing, because then you have a good chance to uh, have the things actually happen when they need to happen. And you follow that up. And as time goes by and you get more insight into where the world is going, you could revisit your back costing analysis and the different, the different development path and say, hey, we're not, not completely on path A now, maybe we should open our readiness to move to path B, or maybe we should reassess the paths because a new development has come in. Uh, we're gonna have pandemics much more often or something like that. So that is my little short description of, of the process. So this is a research paper. So we need to have some sort of a table. There's always a table. And uh, in this case, we wanted to develop a number of criteria for testing. Is backcasting really useful as a strategic management tool? And as I mentioned, uh, we wanted to use VUCA to, to answer that question, because if it can't work on the VUCA, it reduces the relevance of backcasting as a strategic management tool. And then uh, we added two criteria that are more general for strategy, like does it provide direction? Uh, does it show where we are going? And does it give guidance? That uh, means does it help us understand how to get there? So that's the more of the planning, while the direction might be more of the vision and the long-term objectives uh, manifested as corporate intentions. And uh, this is what we found is a bit difficult to see here maybe, but we have the uh, VUCA prime and then Bennett and Lemoyne's management under VUCA and then backcasting. And then we added uh, what does backcasting give that is relevant for the challenges here on the left and uh, how does that help basically? How is it useful? So 
some things that we can point out is that backcasting is directly aiming to give a guidance and a direction if you apply it to form strategies that's the 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 goal is to to find that point in the future and, and show how to get there so good qualification there for both those issues and uh, when it comes to volatility then in the in the first of the VUCA challenges we found let's say support that this mental preparedness this shared understanding and the uh, pre-definition at least roughly of contingency alternatives should be making the firm more able to respond to changes to be able to deal with volatility compared to Bennett and Lemoyne for example they argue that you should stockpile resources to achieve slack so that is also of course one way that you can address volatility but first of all you still have the problem of understanding the change understanding what it means for the organization and what to do about it and so on so there's a lot of mental processing that you need to take and you have the cost of sitting on all these assets and resources that may or may not be useful so we think that it's not quite as strong we should also say that these are not mutually exclusive you, you could of course have uh, some assets and resources ready but with backcasting maybe you have a better way to prioritize looking at the other three when it comes to uncertainty yeah so <laughs> i think it was ansoff who said something uh, like decisions are not based on facts it's based on intentions so facts and data are usually their value is to weed out the worst alternatives not that you really take a decision based on the on the data it, decision is taken on what you want to accomplish that's the, the main factor for a decision. So uh, that is uh, something that we think backcasting can be argued to support this intention giving. And uh, it also shows, and this is connected to complexity, by taking this huge amount of inputs and processing it, it in, into a structured output of paths and, and main strategies you get a fairly good understanding of what you need to focus on what is maybe important what you can disregard and from these more important things where are the critical points where are the white spots on the map and so on so you get a more effective base for gathering more information it's going to gather information precisely where it's needed etc so more specific support there so that is also as i mentioned connected to complexity so uh, none of these methods really reduce complexity of of the world or the strategic problems of a company but the perceived subjective complexity can be reduced uh, we might be more able to have a understanding of what is happening like a structure of connected factors that works reasonably well um, here we have uh, good support from backcasting but uh, management on the book is more like a, either you use specialist or you build a capacity in the organization to work despite complexity um, and VUCA Prime gives even less guidance than that like it makes sense on the chaos and if you have frame complexity and know what you can safely disregard and so on it less, it's less to muddle through it's less to to deal with when you're moving ahead and uh, finally for ambiguity we can argue that we have this uh, long and deep discussion what the organization needs to do and the ways forward how they work what we can do what 
effect things will have and when it will not work and so on. That means that we have a fairly uh, strong means ends logic for our reasoning. We also have an agreement on intention, so we don't mean misunderstand each other as much as we might do. If we don't have this collective sense-making process. So yeah, I mean, overall, we think that backcasting came out pretty strong. And um, these are not, as I said, exclusive. You can do hypothesis testing as a, as a part of your roadmap, uh, for example. But uh, we wanted to validate if backcasting was useful. And we thought, yeah, we could say that it fills at least these criteria, uh, at, at least as good as or better than the other uh, frameworks that we could see out there for dealing with VUCA. So we think that it has a good potential for helping organizations deal with uh, complexity, deal with transitions that are larger than what you can sort of optimize or easily address by waging some options against each other. Um, when, when you have a larger challenge than that, we need to rethink what the company or the organization is about and how it can be playing a role in the future and how the future could be reached. Uh, it, it has a lot of potential as far as this study shows. And it, it has this interesting psychological effect of standing here in the future and looking backwards. You overcome all the constraint-based thinking you have when you look from the present day uh, forward. And although, of course, you can't guarantee that you generate all these links that connect the future with the present or that the future will be exactly as the vision uh, predict that if it's a good future, if it's reasonably likely or uh, plausible, it could be good to work against. And we have some of the stuff that leads us there and some of it needs to take action on. So that would be a good baseline for discussion strategies going ahead. So that is the summary I would say of this article. I hope you enjoy it and uh, that it will be useful for you in the future. Thank you very much.